Andy Breckman is a television and film writer who created the Emmy Award-winning television series, Monk. Ken Friedman is the station manager of WFMU, an independent free-form radio station in New Jersey. For over 30 years, Andy and Ken have hosted Seven Second Delay, a stunt radio program that airs every Wednesday on WFMU. I sit down and talk to these two non-puppeteers all about puppetry on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Welcome to the show that is preserving puppetry through the personal stories of professional puppeteers. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Well, Ken and Andy, thank you for doing this. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Grant. Hey, Grant, quick yes. question. Quick yes. question. Hardly worth mentioning. What show are you referring to? Well, the name of this show is called Under the Puppet, and it is a podcast I do where I talk to uh, puppetry professionals about the world of puppetry and the business of puppetry. So you two are perfect to be on this show. Yes, we are. We're, we're flattered. And how long have you been doing this uh, podcast? Oh, uh, this is the seventh year, I think, of doing this Wow, podcast. fantastic. Okay. So, are there any other, what's your competition? Are there other puppet podcasts? There actually are other puppet podcasts. Those yes. bastards, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Those posers. We all get along. It's a, it's a big, lovable puppet world. Are, are there separate podcasts for different kinds of puppets, like marionettes and shadow puppets and, you know, Jim Henson-style Muppets and things like that? No, I mean, um, no, I don't think there is. I think everybody just tries to – puppetry is such a small community. We just try to um, – Yeah. So you, oh, Grant, I, I do have a follow-up question myself. <laughs> yes. Do you really all get along? Do you really all get along? We do. That's yeah, what I, I, I was wondering the same thing. Like you allow the marionette puppeteers to attend the same meetings. You know who usually gets the the backlash is the ventriloquists. That's a lot of people don't even consider it puppetry, but I do because they're using a puppet. Oh, don't get me started on whether <laughs> ventriloquists are puppets. We could do like five or six episodes right there. But I've done on my show. I've interviewed uh, Mallory Lewis, the daughter of Sherry Lewis, and I've interviewed uh, Willie Tyler uh, from. Did Willie Mallory Tyler wait? Did Mallory Lewis inherit lamb chops? She did. Yes, she didn't she, want to, but she did. Yeah, she didn't want to. Right. <laughs> you not. You yeah, know, I, right. I was kind of raised on lamb chop. I wonder how long Mallory resisted that. <laughs> how could she go out on stage without lamb chop? She, she can't. Well, and supposedly uh, Lamb Chop is built for very small hands, and she had the same hand size as her mom. So. Which, which was her mom, Shari Lewis. Was that also Kukla, Fran, and Ollie? No, that, oh, no, that, that was Fran Allison. Oh, okay. Uh, and, Ken, did you, say, did you say that you were raised by Lamb Chop? Yes. <laughs> that would explain a lot. I have vivid memories of Lamb Chop from my very young childhood. That's one of the questions that I ask on the show. What was your first exposure to puppetry? So was it for Ken, for you, was it Lamb Chop? Yeah, it probably was Lamb Chop. Because I remember that from a house that we moved out of when I think I was four or five years old. Uh, now, you you have uh, Seven Second Delay as a stunt radio show, as you call it. And you have actually, one of the stunts was, Andy, you were a puppet during one episode of the show. I think you were, you got a, uh, an, a big assist on that show, if I recall. But I did have a puppet. Yeah, that we was, that was at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. Right. I had a puppet made of myself, one of the great honors of my life. And I still I still have that puppet. Uh, I do have an interesting problem. I have five kids. And the question is, who will inherit the daddy puppet when I pass? Have you have you used it at all since that show? Do you go around the house and, and I, I use it to I use it to discipline my children. <laughs> but I can't go into detail for that. None of them will want the puppet. <laughs> yeah, none of them will. Am I am I in the am I in the running for the inheritance on the puppet at all? If you'd like to be, if you'd like want to put your name in the hat. I would. Be, yes, I would. Gonna be, yes, we're gonna pick slips of paper out of a hat. Okay. I was gonna leave you the hat itself. No, I, I want to be in the running for the puppet because that's that's actually a very memorable show when when you were a puppet. What happened, Grant, was uh, one of the members of uh, Jim Henson's uh, company actually made the puppet and then controlled the puppet on stage. Oh, at, 
I remembered it. I remembered it as Grant helped to design the puppet. No. Like, well, I think I put you in touch with Tim Legas, oh, okay. maybe well, who you built did. the puppet. Yeah. Well, in baseball, that would be labeled an assist. An assist. Yeah. yeah. And what happened was, I was sitting on stage. Uh, at the theater with the puppet, and Tim was behind the couch controlling the puppet. Andy could not be seen by the audience. Andy was in the sound booth. And whatever Andy said, the puppet had to just purely spontaneously, you know, come up with the right facial and body language yeah. uh, to convey it. And And after about 15 minutes, I felt like I was on stage with a, a real live puppet. It really was strange. He was he was so accomplished at it. Everything was perfectly in sync with what Andy was saying from the sound booth. So the okay, so I do have that experience with a puppet. I had a puppet avatar. Is that a is that a maybe a, a clean way to put it? An yeah. avatar that was on stage for an hour. Also the, that was a, Yes, also known as a puppet. <laughs> That's true. I don't. You're right. <laughs> I don't. You don't have to say. You don't have. To, you don't have to explain it further. Yeah. Uh, that's true. Hey, uh, hey, Grant. Are the puppet? Is the puppet community? Are they fans of the movie Megan? And those kind of horror puppet movies? Yeah, you know, I just interviewed uh, a couple episodes ago the puppeteer. Uh, he's a New Zealand puppeteer, Paul Lewis, and he puppeteered that. Um, that, you know, whenever it wasn't the girl in the sort of little suit walking yeah. around, he said that that movie, when they made it, they didn't want to spend any money on removing him at all or any rods from the show. So anytime you see Megan, he's there hiding behind Megan, just not being seen. So uh, he said it was a, it was a quite a challenge. Oh, I can imagine. It would, would you say that was the best puppet? What, tell me the best puppet movie. Are you a fan of, um, the the movie Magic written by William Goldman. I don't that's I a, don't think I've oh, seen that's it. A, oh that's a that's a ventriloquist uh, horror movie. Well, the best the best puppet movie is Team America. I've oh, interviewed yeah. a lot of people who've worked on Team America by the yeah. by the South Park guys. As, you're absolutely right. Also, Chucky, I guess, is well known the Chucky series. I used to have to stand in front of the TV when I showed my kids. Team America, when they were little, I would stand in front of the TV during the puppet sex scenes. But it was all negated because Ken himself was naked at the time. <laughs> but at least show long enough, I what knew that good was did that do, Ken? <laughs> at least they didn't get to see puppets doing it. They're no, used at, least they did, at least they didn't get to see a strange, unfamiliar penis. Yeah. <laughs> well, a puppet penis, really. Yeah, puppet penis. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not not puppetry related, but sort of in a tangential way. Andy, you worked with Lisa Henson earlier in your career, didn't you? She was she was actually a, 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 a big part of my early career. She worked. She was at Warner Brothers as an executive, and she was a champion of an early script that I wrote, or maybe a couple of scripts. And thanks to her, I got a uh, an overall deal at Warner Brothers that. Uh, it showed their faith, their misplaced faith in me. And But I also, I don't know if it was thanks to her or not, but I did spend one day with Jim Henson. Wow. I got to do that, which I know maybe some of you, a lot of your listeners would be envious of. Yeah. What what was that? If you can talk about it, what, what happened? I would. Uh, he, uh, let me see. He was planning the show, the series Muppet Babies which I guess, was that a cartoon show? Yeah. Okay, so he was planning, the, the Henson Productions was planning Muppet Babies, and what, what these guys do is they pay comedy writers to come in, and it was me and four or five other comedy writers, to pay comedy writers to sit around a big table, and, and they paid us, I don't remember what they paid us, but we signed away all our rights. We waived any rights to any ideas, that we generated. And then we spent the day sitting around in a big conference room with Jim Henson at the end of the table, uh, just generating ideas, just kicking around, uh, uh, you know, brainstorming ideas. And I guess there was either Jim Henson or some assistant was, was taking notes. And uh, we were kicking around ideas for what elements of Muppet Babies might work. And I don't remember my memory, as Ken can tell you, and listeners of my show know, it's the worst. Um, it's a sieve. It's a 
how would you describe my memory, Ken? A leaky sieve. Yeah, it's not even a it's not even a well constructed <laughs> sieve. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a faulty sieve that you get. And I don't. I I wish I had anecdotes to tell you. Although I do remember making Jim Henson laugh was a very sweet and a delightful moment for me. But I don't remember the specifics, and I don't remember if I contributed anything to Mopathy. But uh, I know it's enough to make you, Grant, very jealous of me. Well, did in, in the final in the final Muppet Baby movie, did the Cookie Monster have a free candy van? No, it was <laughs> so no. That, so then that was cut. That was rejected out of out of hand. Yeah, I pitched the whole I pitched the whole sequence where the Cookie Monster was shopping for a a van that had to be soundproof. Right. A soundproof uh, van, like the inside of his garbage can, or the Grouch. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> You're mixing up so many characters, it's hilarious. Yeah, that's right. So that I had that day, but I don't remember any. It drives my wife insane because when somebody famous is mentioned uh, in conversation, I can say, "Oh, I I spent the day with him," or "I spent a week with him." And then my wife will say, well, what, what was they like? And I absolutely have no memory of it. So if I was writing my memoirs, it would be just like eight pages of, of just the worst kind of uh, introductions to people. Well, let me ask this. You brought up pitching, and uh, I have heard mixed things about pitching. And pitch. I know maybe you necessarily haven't pitched a puppet show, but if you were pitching a puppet show— would you bring the puppets into the pitch? Because I've heard things like, don't even think about bringing them in the in the room. Or then I've also heard people say, yes, definitely bring the puppets in. Oh, I would bring the puppets into the room. I would do it. It's a full multimedia. Uh, but I would I would keep it short. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at pitching. But I, I've often brought in uh, props and photos. And I've had my assistant put together montages to illustrate a point i would not only bring the puppets in i would spend a little time and a little money doing a proof of concept video uh i would actually do two or three minutes of a very crude representation of what of what you hope to be doing uh, you know unless you're the south park guys uh if you're going in cold you really have to have to uh, knock them dead i have some friends i have a couple of good friends Tom Gamble and Max Cross, who created a marionette puppet show called Red Pepper. They actually went to pilot. This is in 19, mid-80s, 84, 85. And they were, they were offered a, uh, a writing job on the original Simpsons, before the Simpsons uh, uh, premiered. They could have been on the original staff. But they instead, they instead chose to decline that offer and commit themselves to this puppet show, this puppet pilot that they made, I think, for NBC. So that's a decision they regret <laughs> for the rest of their life. But they would be they would be great guests because they, I'm sure they'd proudly show you their, their failed pilot uh, that they're very pr- deservedly very proud of. Did it ever uh, air? No, no, it was a no, it was a busted what they call a busted pilot. Aww. But it was a very crude howdy duty style marionette living among real people. <laughs> the way the way Mork the way Mork the alien lived, you know, in a real in the real world. Huh. Or or uh, not not Mork, I'm sorry, Mork is good, but Alf I guess is a better example. I was in I was in the Burbank airport one day and I had a a sweater on that said puppeteer on this, you know, it was a crew gift. And uh, this guy comes up to me and goes, are you puppeteer? And I go, yeah. And he goes, I worked on ALF, the whole series. And I said, wow, that's really great. And he goes, no, it was responsible for my cocaine habit. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, so whenever I see a puppeteer, I go, no, thank you. I don't want to work on a puppet thing. Now, is John, is, is, would you consider John Malkovich a classic puppet movie? Yeah, yeah. We interviewed the, the marionette. Uh, Philip Huber is the guy who did all – he got a marionette to do a somersault, which had never been done before for that film. But yeah. Yeah, you, you have to do it almost at gunpoint. You have to threaten the marionette. You mean being John Malkovich? You're talking about that yes. movie? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I have one more question here as we wrap up. Uh, you two have worked as a creative team for 30 years on this show, Seven Second Delay. What's the secret to maintaining a creative partnership for that long? Huh. <laughs> That's a good question. It is a good question. I, I know my answer, but I'm, I'm very curious about what Ken would say. <laughs> I think I think Andy and I share uh, certain key values that that have uh, made it a lot of fun to keep uh, collaborating after all these years. I mean, for one thing, I think we're very very different, uh, which I, which has been a real asset because it it has meant that we don't really get bored with each other. It's hard to predict one another. Um, but uh, and Andy and I both really love coming up with ideas. Uh, simply th that nobody has ever attempted before on the radio. I think our motives might be slightly different for doing that. Um, mine are kind of more, I'm just always up for a good experiment to find out what will happen. And I guess Andy is uh, thinking similar things, but more comedically, I guess. Uh, but I think the fact that we're both really into trying things, knowing full well that there's a great chance it might fail, um, has been has been a, a big part of the collaboration for for so many decades. Well, that's a complete crock. Of shit. <laughs> and how would you answer the question, Andy? If I'm going to be honest, I'm from the very beginning. I've been sexually attracted to the man. <laughs> no, I. You know, well, it's a great question. I think I, I once heard that Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. Who? How long were they together? That was close to thirty years. I heard they never socialized with each other. They only kind of hung out on the on the show itself, you know, on the, on the couch itself. And that might be part of the secret uh, that we don't, I mean, I occasionally will meet Ken for dinner and, and we'll go out together, but uh, you know, it's, it's one hour a week together, which is the secret to most of my relationships. <laughs> Just minimize, minimize the exposure. And part of the, and a lot of what Ken said is absolutely true. I, I it rings true for me. But in addition to that, I so appreciate that Ken offers me and all the disc jockeys on FMU a safe space. I mean, Ken is a First Amendment purist, and I get to say very stupid things without fear of being uh, called on it or canceled. And uh, it's, for me, like therapy. So, you know, it's like instead of going to a therapist every week, I get to. I got to go to FMU. So that would be my answer. There there was that period of time. It was very brief. There was like a six-month period of time there where you actually were worried about getting canceled because you had a new show coming. You had a new show yeah. that, <laughs> that was well, in production, was... and it was sort of at the height of the Me Too era, and, and you and yeah. I... <laughs> and then I remembered that nobody is listening, <laughs> which was a great, a great relief. <laughs> Well, I love too, Ken, what you said is that you do these shows knowing that it might fail and it probably, you know what I mean? Like, that's just a great attitude to create stuff because then what, you know, what can go wrong? Like, you well, know, the stakes are so damn low. That's the other thing. They, you know, no, there's no consequence to our shows failing. Yeah. Now, now, what do you think now? Now, uh, before we go, uh, Grant, what do you think attract, what type of person is attracted to puppeteering? Uh, what <laughs> personality characteristics is it are they failed comedians? Are they are they people that are failed so that have failed socially and can't connect with other real human beings? What manner of like, failure what, what, are you, Grant? Yeah, what what do they what do they yeah, we assume that they're failures. What do they have in common? You know what I think, honestly, is, and I can't speak for all puppeteers, but it's the whole idea of like a what is it, introverted extrovert? You know what I mean? Like somebody who... Oh, a shy egomaniac. This... <laughs> yeah, a shy egomaniac. For, you know, because it's... A lot of puppeteers will, will you know, do anything with the puppet in front of the camera. But then once you turn the camera on them, they're like, oh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> Just keep it on the puppet, you know, and you can kind of say anything with the puppet. Does that describe you as well? I was doing acting first. Um, and I just kind of was... Puppet was like a side thing, like a hobby. I never really thought like, oh, hey, I could do this as a living. Um, and then just started 
you know, developing my own shows with a puppet and then uh, got noticed by someone at the Jim Henson company to come in and start training there. And now it's like, oh, yeah, this is my thing. <laughs> it took forever to find it, but this is this is the thing, you know. Uh, and, you know, I, I actually do a ventriloquism act when I do when I, I occasionally I will find myself doing stand up and it ends. My stand up ends with my famous ventriloquism act. It is really uncanny. Have you ever seen it, Grant? I I may have heard it, like if you did it on some live show or something. But oh well, if you've heard it, it's it's nowhere near as magical as when you see it. See it, yeah. Because again, again, it's it's just like the uh, puppet. The puppet has a life of its own, and you can't. Well, that's true. The puppet does have a life. Of its you can't. Own. You can't see Andy's that's lips. True. Andy's lips don't appear to be moving at all. It's really amazing. Well, I'm a little. Oh, Ken, you're being very generous. I'm a little bit out of practice, but. I, I don't know how I could ever do it for Grant, but some, maybe the next, if we're ever invited back, I will, I would be honored to uh, share my uh, eventual quiz act with you. I'll book an Under the Puppet live show and you'll be the headliner. You can come in and. If you do a puppet live show, I would be, uh, that would be amazing. Do you, uh, do you do that sometimes? Do you. Uh, I've, I mean, there's puppet slams everywhere uh, in every city in the world. They, they have puppet slams and it's just, you know, it's like a poetry slam. It's just somebody comes up with a, a under five minute long puppet act and they do it um, and you see everything. You see every kind of puppet act uh, in the thing. But wow. um, yeah, I've I've always wanted to, to book a show like that. That, sound, that sounds thrilled. great. Well, you know, Ken has a theater in near outside of New York in Jersey City. Yeah, I'd love to do a puppet slam. Oh, I can. Yeah, I can get you in touch with people for sure. OK, but, but man, would that be enough to get you on a plane to come out to uh, New York? Absolutely. I was going to try and I was I had already travel booked when you had the Andy Mation Festival or else I would have come out for it. Oh, Just my God. No, thanks for your thanks for contributing to that, too. That's that was yeah. And Grant also did a, a director's commentary for the DVD, Andy. Oh, my gosh, Grant. That's above and beyond. But Grant, if you would help. Uh, organize a puppet slam at uh, Monty Hall in Jersey City. We would be, we would be. I'm speaking for Ken now, without even consulting him. We'd be honored, <laughs> and and I would do my ventriloquism act, and I would get Ken to do something or other. <laughs> Absolutely, we can, we can do it. We can. There's so many puppets. There's so much puppet stuff in New York um, that it's. You what know, a you night would, that would be! What a great. You see night some amazing night. stuff. You would see some what a amazing great things. night that would be. And would they need a would they need a special lead design stage or anything or would it? No, most puppet slams are just on a normal stage, normal audience. Yeah, I mean, you know, like sometimes, depending on the act, they might. Oh, we need a black light or we need a spotlight zoomed in right here. But then if if somebody needs something really technical, you don't have, we just say thank you, <laughs> you know, and pick people who can do the act. You know. Well, Grant, we should be in touch about it. I actually would really love to do that. Sure, let's do it. Grant, thanks Excellent. for thanks for interviewing us. Well, of no, course. Grant should Grant should be thanking us. It's his podcast too. Yes. So well, Ken, Grant, Andy, you... thank you, thank you so much for being here on Under the Puppet today. I appreciate it. Oh, it was our, it was our, I, well, it was my pleasure. I can't speak for Ken. No, my pleasure more than your pleasure. I think I, I, I was pleasured more than you were. <laughs> that's true. I enjoyed it, but Ken enjoyed it more. I, yeah, that's I, that was my sense. All right, thanks a lot, Grant. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Good Andy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. My thanks to Andy and Ken for being on the show. For links to some of the things we discussed, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 83, over at underthepuppet.com. Now it's time to announce the winner of episode 82's giveaway for a copy of Chad Williams' book, 50 Hand Puppet Techniques, Hidden Secrets, and Tricks Revealed. The question was, what was the topic of the first puppet piece Chad was ever involved in? And the answer was, Jell-O. And the winner is Charlene Trost. Congratulations, Charlene, your book is on the way. This episode, we're giving away two autographed WFMU stickers. One signed by Ken Friedman and the other by Andy Breckman. And to make this giveaway even more puppet related, we're throwing in a hardcover copy of The Art of the Puppet by Bill Baird. To be entered to win, all you have to do is answer this question from the episode you just heard. What was the name of the puppet pilot that Andy's friends made? When you find the answer, send it in an email to underthepuppet at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway and you'll be entered to win. All entries for this giveaway must be received by May 15th, 2023. 
The winner will be chosen at random from all correct entries and be announced on the June 2023 episode of the show. One entry per household, and due to recent issues shipping the prizes to winners, these giveaways are now only open to those listeners with a mailing address in the United States of America. Good luck! Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I want to send out a special thank you to all the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who help make the show possible. Patreon patrons at the producer level and above who get a special shout-out are Eve Cunning, Kathy Crawford, Andrew Calcagno, Tony Urbano, Brandy, David Akers, Paul, Scott Armstrong, and Vicki Sebring. To become a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. And thank you for your support. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. If you have questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604. Or click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can also send your feedback via email to underthepuppet at gmail.com, or you can connect with the show on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter by searching for Under the Puppet. And don't forget to tell a friend about the show. This episode featured music by Dan Ring and was expertly edited by Steven Staver. Thank you so much for listening. Under the Puppet is copyright 2023 Saturday Morning Media Grant Pachoco Executive Producer. All rights reserved www.saturdaymorningmedia.com Under the Puppet proudly presents The Adventures of Timmy the Tooth Reunion. In this almost 90-minute video, you will hear great stories from the cast and crew who brought this amazing puppet show to life. Plus, you'll see never-before-seen artwork and exclusive behind-the-scenes video. Under the Puppet's Timmy the Tooth Reunion is available right now at timmy.underthepuppet.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned, we'll be right back.